here at Ancient of Days Worship Center. How many of you are excited for the word? Yes. You know, it's going to be a different service this evening because what I really want to share with you is we need to get to a point in our lives of surrender. And what do you mean by when the pastor says surrender? Because we are in a beautiful book called Galatians. And Galatians is not about a church. See, people, I've heard pastors say, oh, it's about Galatians. It's about many churches that Paul was writing to. And the church that I'm speaking to right now is a church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. is a person next to you. And when we ask God to get us to a point of surrender, it's everything from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. The way we think, the way we talk, some of our um, behaviors. Because when we get to that point and we begin to worship God in spirit and in truth, God will begin to move on behalf of his congregation. He will take things in your life that you didn't think you could get rid of and he will remove them. And you know what? The greatest thing about God is nothing is impossible, church, with God, right? With God, everything's possible. So let's get into Galatians, the first chapter. And I'm going to catch you up, verses 1 through 10. Give me an amen when you're there. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Yeah. Paul, an apostle, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you to the grace, to call to the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or any angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, that what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade man or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please man, I would not be a good bondservant of Christ. And the church says, Amen. You know, what a way to start this off as we go back to verse 6 and we begin to dissect it. Let me set the foundations. Paul was speaking to the people that were perverting the gospel. It's no different than 2020. We have people that are perverting the gospel. And you know how they get away with the perversion of the gospel? Can I tell you? It's because when they begin to pervert the gospel, God's children don't know what they're perverting. That's right. wow. And that's why it's so important that we are in church this evening, that we open up the word of God and we begin to allow the power of God to begin to change our lives, to begin to move us. Because you know what? We cannot be part of, you know, picking and choosing what we want to do. We have to teach the word in its entirety. We have to be able to let the people know what the book is talking about. So what was going on was the people, the Jewish people were taking back the law of Moses. And the law of Moses was the Ten Commandments. And he was telling the people, you have to follow this law. But see, we didn't have to follow that law no more because Jesus Christ was already on the scene, right? He brought the New Testament in our lives. And you know why? Because God looked down upon his children and he said, they can't do this Mosaic law. They can't fulfill this law of Moses. Because everyone is a sinner. No, it was impossible for anybody to do it. So being God, being peace, right, and grace, he sent his son, and the word goes on to say he gave himself for us. Who gave himself for us? Jesus Christ gave himself for us. And you know why he did that? Because he knew that if we were under the Old Testament law, that we were all going to go to hell. But see, God has a plan as he does right now to the person sitting next to you. He has a plan. But the only way God's plan will ever work is if you come to complete surrender. So what happened was Jesus came on the scene and he gave himself. And you know what? You cannot begin to live as a Christian until you know what it is to give yourself. And I'm not talking about to the world because we do a good job of giving everything to the world. 
When we go out and we have a beer, we do it well, right? We make sure we leave that club drunk, getting our money's worth. But what happens when we come in the presence of God? We need to give Him our all. And this is what we're going to learn as we get into verse 6. Paul was looking upon the people and he says he was amazed. He was looking at people that knew Christ. They saw Christ. They saw the miracles of Christ. But they began to be perverted in their minds because other people were saying, you don't have to follow Christ. You can go back to the old ways. Can you imagine somebody would be so amazed to see a Christian out there doing what a Christian shouldn't be doing? And this is where Paul starts off. Let's go to verse 6. And the title is, A Danger of a Different Gospel. So in verse 6, it says this. I marvel, underline the word, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Paul says, I marvel. You know that grace and peace, what did I teach you last week, right? Grace came from Greek and peace came from where? The Jews, right? And grace and peace is the constitution, is our constitution of Christianity. You know how we have a constitution in the United States? Well, our constitution is grace and peace because when you begin to show grace and peace, you begin to show that you are a Christian who has given themselves for others. So let's ask ourselves this question. When have you completely gave yourself for someone else? Well, pastor, they're a sinner. Why would I do that? Well, why would Jesus give himself for you when you were a sinner? Because the word of God goes on to say he loved you while you were what? Yet. He didn't say while you were completed. He said while you were yet sinners. And this is why we are in this book, if you understand, because if we don't give ourselves to the lost and to the poor, who's going to do a good job of taking them? The enemy, right? So he says, I marvel. And the Greek word for marvel is thama. T-H-A-V-M-A, thama. And you know what that means? It's a bad sign is what it means in Greek. In other words, Paul is marveling. It's, it's a bad sign to him that he sees the children of God going after a different gospel. You know what we're taught as Christians, as pastors, when you see somebody straying away from the faith, you know what's happening? Can I tell you? Yeah. They're not in their word. They don't have a prayer life. Because to stray away from the faith means that you haven't even been in the faith. Because when you are grounded in the word, I can look at you, brother. And I can see the love that Christ has for you, right? So who am I to say contrary to what God says? He loves you. But when somebody begins to stray away from the faith, they begin to see through the eyes of the world, not the eyes of Christ's word. So he says, I marvel. In other words, it's a bad sign for Paul that he's saying, what's going on? These people know the word. They understand the word, but they're straying away from the word. And you know why? Because they're outside of the word. Because if they were in the word of God, and these people came to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ, they would look at them and point at them and say, no. You are not going to do that. Well, what do you mean I'm not going to do that? Because I know the word. The word is contrary to what you're doing. I'm not going after a different gospel because there is no different gospel other than the gospel that comes out of God's holy word, right? Yeah. So he starts off to say, I marvel. And then underline the word in verse 6 where he says, so soon. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you. You know what so soon means in Greek? No, it's not a Chinese soup so soon. No, it's turning away so soon. See, when a Hispanic says so soon, it sounds like a soup, right? That you would get from a Chinese restaurant. But so soon means easily. Easily is what it means. It doesn't take any effort to turn them away. You know why? Because a person that's not grounded in the faith, it's easy to turn them away. You can go and tell them anything you want them to know and believe. Why? Because they're not in the faith. And they're easily persuaded that what you are saying is the truth. So he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon. In other words, so quickly from him who called you. 
Why do you think the church is not strong the way the church needs to be strong? Because God's children continue to turn away. You know what I've seen in all the years that I've been in ministry? And it's been 20 plus years. I've seen people come in and start walking with God. And I've seen God begin to move in them. And then they're nowhere to be seen again. Yeah. And those people that are nowhere to be seen, they never wanted it in the first place. And you know what? When I do run into them, they tell me, oh, well, I'm going through it. Well, brother, I go through it every day and every second of my life. But the only way that I overcome it is the name of Jesus Christ that I allow him to move me. I allow him to penetrate those walls that the enemy has built up in my life. So when someone turns away, you can't give them an excuse to say, oh, poor mijito or mijita, you're going through it. We are, as God's children, going through it every day of our life. When you wake up to when you fall asleep. Because as long as you are alive, you are a threat to the enemy. Yes. So, so soon means quickly. And Paul says, he's amazed. Not so much that they're turning away so soon. Because they're one step from deliverance. We are one step from having a family member come to Christ. And they may not even be in church. But as long as you stay grounded and you don't turn away so soon, they are one step away from being delivered in the name of Jesus Christ. Not in our name, not in our timing, not when we want them to be delivered. When God has an set appointment time for them to be delivered because the church of Jesus is praying for the deliverance of the saints coming straight out of the pits of hell. We are one step from deliverance and that's why Paul says, I marvel, church, that you are turning away so soon. Because if you just weather the storm, there is a blessing. You just need to weather the storm. And when you feel that you can't weather, bow your head in the presence of a holy God. And know that God is going to take you the rest of the way. There's a picture of a bird, a real picture that National Geographic took. A hurricane was coming in and he's a little tiny bird. Look at me, church. A little tiny bird. And he knew that he could not fly through the hurricane. He knew that if he got up into the sky, that the wind was going to cause him to be hurt or even killed. So he went to a fence post. And the storm began to kill him in the Category 5. And the picture shows him with his head down. And the rain beating upon the little body. But he knew that if he stayed his ground, he knew that if he did not move, that the storm too would pass. He knew that. He wasn't trying to fight something that he couldn't win. But he knew the one that caused the wind to cease. If he just waited a little bit longer, he was going to receive deliverance. And that's why Paul is saying, I marvel from him who called you, in verse 6, in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Listen, church, they were turning away from a person as they turned to false ideas. You know that the word false ideas just means a different gospel? The enemy has so many false ideas that he wants to indoctrinate indoctrinate you with and that's why God gave us his word so that we can counter that indoctrination so that when the devil starts to whisper lies in your ears you go to the gospel and you ask yourself how and what would Jesus do in a situation like this to turn away from the true gospel is always turning away from the person of Christ Jesus not the God the person, because Jesus came as a person. Can I tell you why he came as a person? He didn't come down in majesty with a legion of angels all around him with swords of fire in their hands. He came down as a person. And when he came down as a person, he walked as a person, just as you walk. He was tempted as a person, just as you're tempted. He endured the persecutions as a person, just as you endure it. He was laughed at 
He was spit at. He was mocked. He was crucified. He was hit with the cat of nine tails as it dug into his back and they pulled it. Chunks of skin came out and they did it again. But he walked as a person to let you know, each and every one of you, that you don't have to walk in the steps that you walked in. You know why? Because he overcame it. So get back to why is Paul in a, why is he amazed? Because a church is one step away from deliverance. You may have a little one next to you here this evening. That little one has a future. And the future is going to be paid by what you do. The legacy that you leave. They may not have parents or grandparents or uncles or aunts that bring them to church. But because you step in the gap and you cover them with your prayers and you cover them with your faithfulness and you cover them with your obedience, you are providing them a legacy so that when they come into harm's way, they can say, what did Nana do? What did Tata do? What did Thea do? What did Theo do? And you set the foundation for them to be successful. But if you give up and you turn away so easily and so soon, what are you bringing destruction? Not only to yourself, but to the generations that are linked to your bloodline. Yes. Jesus never gave up. That's why the generations that were linked to Jesus' bloodlines were successful. They were fought in victory. Why? Because Jesus stood his ground. As the same way the church this evening needs to begin to stand their ground. And they need to begin to worship God with every part of their being. And they don't look at other people's downfalls. They don't look at other people's faults. They look upon their Lord and say, Lord, you loved me while I was yet a sinner. I am to love them because if you bring them there to your presence, you will save them and you will bring them out of destruction. So he marvels. Verse 7. Go with me there, please. Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you. Underline the word, there are some who trouble you. And want to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. Catch this word, church. This was a very important word that we learned in hermeneutics. Which is, underline that word, which is. I'm going to give you some examples of how powerful this is. In verse 7, I'm going to read it again. Which is not another. In other words, there is not another. There is one true gospel. And his name is Jesus Christ. The Lord of every Lord. The God of every God that may be in our life. The ruler of heavens and earth. The creator of the foundations of this world. The creator of us. And he says, which is, tells three things about a different gospel. And I want you to write it down. It's going to tell us three things. Number one, it was an illegitimate gospel. It was a criminal gospel. It never had any power or authority other than that which you gave it. It's the same thing that if you go out into the streets of Albuquerque and you do something, you walk into a grocery store and you put someone at gunpoint and you take the money that's in the cash register, is that criminal? Is it? Yes. And to be criminal, you have to pay the price, right? It's the same thing as when the church of Jesus Christ do not love one another. That we are in division. That we are at odd with one another. That we are slanderous. That we are deceitful. That everything that we do is on our own accord, not the accord of God's word. It becomes illegitimate. It becomes criminal. And it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ where he gave himself for us. You see where I'm going? Because until we understand that this different gospel, which is, there is no other gospel. If God says if you don't love your brother or your sister, what does he say? What does he go on to say? You don't love me. Is that pretty plain and simple? Very. Very, right? Number two, are you with me? It was not good at all. But trouble. Why do you think that the enemy persuades us with that that looks good, but it's not. It's trouble. Can I tell you something? Can, can we be honest with one another? How many of you have been in the world? Let's be honest. I think all of us should raise our hands. 
So do you remember that when you did something in the world that you knew that was not honorable to God, but it felt good? Right? Come on, it felt good, right? When you walked into a club and you started getting that groove on and the buzz started kicking in and you felt really good. Problems went away, they were gone. But the next day you paid the price, right? You woke up hungover, you were sick to your stomach. With more problems. But it didn't last. Exactly. And this is what Paul is saying. The illegitimate gospel is never going to last you. The same way a Christian who was hot one day and cold the other and then lukewarm in the middle. It's illegitimate. It's not what Christ gave himself for. He gave himself for the church. He gave himself so that you right now, and here it goes, that you can give yourself to those who are not capable of giving themselves back to you. You know, God woke me up last night when I went to the restroom and he specifically had me look in the mirror. And I looked in the mirror and I'm like, what are you doing, God? He says, see that person? He is flawed. He is sin. Other people still judge him for his character. Other people still look upon what he did back in 1990, but I don't look upon that. I look upon the child of God. I looked upon my son who gave himself on the cross so that you can be victorious and successful. And I was like, oh Lord, you see me as a son? Yes, I do. That's the way we need to see each other as sons and daughters. We're so, we're so quick to write somebody off. I don't like the way you look at me, brother. I don't, I don't like all those tattoos on your body, man. You're nothing but trouble. You may not see tattoos here, but they're in here. Right? But can you imagine when you look at someone and say, First Peter, a royal priesthood, a royal generation, clothed in purple, clothed in majesty, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ? How could a Savior give himself for us? Can I tell you why? The same way he expects you to give yourself for others. The church will never be healthy as long as there is division. And this is what Paul is dealing with. So that was number two. I said I was going to give you three, right? It was a distortion to the true gospel. A distortion. And then he goes on to say in verse 7, which is not another. Paul recognized that this different gospel was not really another gospel at all. Those who promoted this different gospel perhaps said, we know that the message is different from Paul's, but his truth is not our truth. People say that this day. Oh, I know you're a Christian, but you know, your truths are not my truths. I choose to do what I want, but God will forgive me. And you choose to do what you want, and God will forgive you. Yes. If it's a true, heartfelt repentance so that God can forgive you. See, it's going to get a little bit deeper because he goes on to say this. They have their gospel, we have ours. But is that true? No. Why not? Because we have one gospel. And the ones that choose not to follow after this gospel, you know why? Because this gospel, you have to be committed. This gospel, you have to be faithful. This gospel, you have to be obedient. You know why other people want another gospel? They want to write their book all over again? Because they want to choose to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And God says that every knee will bow, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. What are we going to be bowing to? What are we going to be confessing to? What we did, church, with this holy word. Why do you think Paul gave up the ghost? Why do you think John gave up the ghost? Why do you think all these people gave up the ghost? So that he knew someday we were going to be preaching about this gospel. Not another gospel, because there is no other gospel. There is one true gospel. And other men have tried to pervert it, but they have not succeeded. There were many books written where Jesus was taken out, where the Holy Ghost was taken out. But let me tell you something. They had to rewrite it. And they had to rewrite it. 
This has stood its ground for <coughs> generations. This has healed the paralytic. This has healed the blind man. This has healed the bitterness. This has healed the backbiting. This has healed the gossip. This has healed every single thing that elevates itself above the one true gospel. Right. So, which is not another, as I said, there is not another. See, those who promoted a different gospel were bringing a false gospel. And Paul goes on to say, gospel, which means, do you guys know? Good news. Mm -hmm. So, if gospel means the good news, how did the lost and the sinner ever know the good news if you ain't sharing it? Can I go a little bit deeper than that? Because yeah. that, that could leave you off with a free pass, right? But if you ain't living the good news, nobody ever knows that there is a good news. Right. You know that Christians have a bad rap? You know that I was brought up in a family that were a bunch of holy rollers, and I'm speaking it. And if they don't like it, well, they come to me and we'll pray about it. I love them. But I was raised in a family that were Christians but when church was over, they were standing in their front yards bashing everybody. I was a little kid. When I had my family members, all oh, they would go to church and raise hands and hallelujah, and I love you, you love me, we all love each other. And then they would go to the front yards and they would point the finger at the drug addicts across the street and say, they're a bunch of losers. Don't trust them when they come out of their door. Lock your doors because they'll steal everything that you have. They're no good, man. They just need to leave this earth because they're not doing anybody any good. And I'm like, Lord, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want to be one. I don't want to be one of those. And I wasn't one of those. I strayed away from the word because of those who caused me to stumble. Because my little eyes saw them praising God with this hand and putting the mean of middle finger with this hand towards someone else. Let's be honest. Yeah. And I would walk around and as I got into getting closer with God, you know what God told me that was? A hypocrite. So we need to change the norm back. We need to bring Christ back in Christianity. And to bring Christ back is we have to surrender ourselves. We have to love when we don't want to love. We have to read when we don't want to read. We have to bring Christ back in Christianity so that the church will go through a revival. So that people will know that there is a good news that is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And the good news is they may never open up a Bible. They may never have a Bible. But when you walk into the door, they see the gospel of a living Christ in you. In you. And they come up to you and say, why are you so happy? Why aren't you like all those other ones who just look to cause division, who look to do things contrary to the word? Why are you different? And then you can share, I am different because Christ gave himself for me. For me, for you, for our children. See, so the word means good news. Paul meant there is no good news in this different gospel. It was only bad news. But it wasn't really any same different. You know why it became different? Because people didn't know what the true gospel said. What the true gospel revealed. There is a movement out there called the King James Movement. I didn't think I'd go here, but I'm going to go here. And they spend so much time bashing people. I've gotten emails. I've gotten messages saying you guys are a cult because you teach out of the new King James Version. It's a King James movement. Look at it on Facebook. And you know what? Praise be to God. King James is the word of God, right? Yes. But if there is no love back to what they're preaching, it is a different word. And it is not the word that I am bound under by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let me tell you something. I chose to do the new King James Version because it's easier for you to understand and I like what they told me just recently. Oh, you teach out of the New King James Version? Well, our word is the only word. And I'm like, devil, you're a liar. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 
If you want to be technical, the King James was not the original word of God. It was changed twice. You want to get a little bit more technical, go to the Geneva. That dates way further back than the King James. Right? But I'm not going to fight with them because King James is the word of God as a new King James. But don't put people down. How are you sharing the gospel, which is the good news, if you're looking at someone and putting them down because they read out of a different book? If I'm dyslexic and I have a third grade reading level, well, then it's going to be too hard for me to understand the King James or the New King James Version. That's why they have the English Standard Version, the American Standard Version. God knew that he had to get his message out to the people on their level, not on yours. So let me tell you something. For the email that I got a couple of days, I'm going to answer your question. The King James Version translate verse 6. Let's go back to verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from he who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Underline that word different gospel in verse 6. The King James puts unto another gospel. There is not another gospel, right? So you want to be technical, you want to be legalistic. The King James put unto another gospel. There is no other gospel. That's why the new King James puts it this way. It translated much better in this place because it makes a distinction between a different and another. Because my Bible in verse 6 says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. But the King James put to another gospel. There is no other gospel, right? See, but we cannot be fighting amongst little simple things. You know, people come up to me and say, I don't believe in speaking in tongues. Well, they're not gonna they're not gonna go to hell because they don't believe in speaking in tongues. We let little things in the body of believers divide the church. I've had people say, Well, I'm a pre-trip, I'm a mid-trip, I'm a post-trip, and that's when Christ is coming for the church. And they what I am is what the word of God says, and I disagree with them, but I'm not gonna go to them and say you're wrong and you're part of a cult or you're a heathen. I don't let the little things divide me. And that's where the church needs to get the heart of Christ back in. We let little simple things divide our minds. And the word of God says, a double-minded man or woman is unstable in all their ways. In all, not some, in all their ways. So you saw the King James. Read it for yourself you have a King James. It says that. Okay? Could be a typo. But there is no other gospel. That's why we do the New King James Version because it's easier for under, people to understand. We have different levels of walks here. We have people with degrees. We have people who never graduated. We have people who never came out of elementary school. But it relates to them. You go to a church that you're going to relate to. If you go to a church where the pastor the PhD and he uses words that you don't understand, you're going to get lost. You know why I chose the pastor? See, you don't know something about us, but I'm going to share this with you. We are a deliverance church. We are a mission church. You know why? Because I don't like staying behind these four walls. Can I get an amen? I'm not made to stay behind these four walls. I'm made to go out into the highways and byways. And the reason why I haven't, because of this law that's in in effect to keep people safe, is the reason why I haven't gone. But if this wasn't around, we'd be out in the streets doing ministry. Because you know why I want to model myself after my Christianity, after Christ. And Christ never stayed in the palace with the kings and queens. I don't even recall one time that he was in the palace with the kings and queens. Do you? If you find it in the word of God, let me know the scripture because I want to study it. Yes. But he wasn't there because he wanted to be there. He was there because he was brought there in front of the Sanhedrin. He didn't say, oh, I want to go hang out with Pontius Pilate. I want to go see what the lighter shade of people are living, man. I want to see how they're living in at large. No, he was about his father's business. And you know the crazy thing about Jesus is leprosy was the most contagious disease. But he never stopped anyone from touching him. Because they knew that if they could get to him, that's where their health and healing was going to come. But we get to a point where I don't like you. 
you're bad news. Well, you know what? I love when someone tells me I'm bad news and they don't like me because I'm like, you know what? When's the last time you looked in the mirror? But the one that counts is the one that loves you no matter what. Right? Let me tell you a story about a tumbleweed. A tumbleweed grows into a green, ugly bush. No flowers, no nothing. You know why they call them tumbleweeds? Because when they die, they tumble down the road. But before they die, the wind comes along and takes the seeds as they're dead and scatters it all over Albuquerque. Haven't you ever wondered how you could get a weed in a place that it shouldn't even be? Because the wind scatters it and it flows all, it spreads all its seeds. Can you imagine when the Christian begins to spread the gospel of the good news? Instead of backbiting, instead of gossiping, instead of um, just being contrary to the word of God, they scatter. You know, I'm a truck driver. Can I tell you another story? There's this thing that says G O A L, get out and look. And when we stall out, they tell us if you can get off the freeway, get off the freeway. The freeway is the most dangerous place to be. If your vehicle doesn't allow you to because it won't move, then you have to stay there. Then you have to put out your triangles. And you know why they say get off the freeway? And I've even had it blown out where I've damaged the rim and I didn't get in trouble because they wanted me off the freeway. Because when you're standing on the side of the freeway, it's one of the most dangerous places to be. Because we have videos where the truck driver has come out and a semi goes right by him and the tire goes out and the rim kills him. Or we have videos where a semi is going and hits a rock in the freeway and it pops up and the driver's standing out on the side waiting for the tow truck and it hits him and it kills him. Why are we standing in a place where God says, I gave myself to you so that you wouldn't have to stand in these kind of places. So instead of sowing seed of discord, you're sowing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Am I helping somebody? You're looking at people and you're looking at them through the eyes of Jesus. And when you look at them, Jesus is not a respecter of age, wrinkles, body type, hair color. He's a respecter of the spirit and the soul that lives within you. A few more. It's, it's a tough gospel, right? It's not coming from me. Is it tough? But you know what? Thank God for it being tough because it'll open up your eyes here this evening. I want the gospel to be tough. I don't want it to be watered down. I don't want it to make you sit here and laugh. And then you leave these doors and you go straight back to your old ways headed to hell. I want you to be able to ponder upon the word and say, is that me? Is he speaking to me? And the pastor going to say, I don't even know you. But the Holy Spirit is speaking to you so that he can free you from every bondage, from every chain, from everything that you are doing to scatter division and you bring in gospel. See, I want to get back to that pulpit, but... For some reason, I can never get back. I, I like being down there. I'm going to move the pulpit down there. So, Paul wrote, they brought you a completely different gospel. They claim it's just an alternative gospel, but it isn't. Let's go to verse 7 again. Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you. Are some of you being troubled here this evening? Is the devil troubling you? Better yet, we blame everything on the devil when it's we that do it. You know, I used to be one of those persons that used to walk around and say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> Come on. That old devil's attacking me. He ain't attacking you. He don't even have to attack you. You belong to him. He lets you self-destruct. It's like the little kid that said, and I was that little kid in elementary, my mom will tell you the story. The teacher said, don't ever put a fork in an electrical outlet, and I put a fork in an electrical outlet. <laughs> the devil made me do it. Brother, I ain't no devil involved. It's, it's ignorance. Well, not even ignorance. Ignorance means lack of knowledge. It's just stupidity because they told you not to do it and you did it. Curiosity. And curiosity killed the cat. I know cat. I may be a roaring lion, the lion of Judah. 
but I ain't no kitty cat. And if we were kitty cats, why don't we pray enough? When a person that comes up to us that we don't like, and we start going, <laughs> <laughs> see, when a cat likes you, he puts himself up against you. <laughs> but instead, we go. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, brother. Y'all to relate to somebody. I know you like that. Isn't it true? And I don't like cats. Forgive me, Lord. But when they like you, cats know you don't like them because they come and they rub up against you and all you hear. I'm like, how can that ugly thing make that noise? And if you have cats, forgive me. But see, cats are like counterfeit Christianity. Can I go there? Yeah. I brought her two brother Tomcats that were 13 pounds a piece, and they were the loveliest thing in the bed and in the animal control. I should have just left them there. They're like, Rrr. I'm like, oh, how pretty. I want to get bounty points of my girlfriend at the time. I'm going to bring her two cats. And the guy at the animal shelter said, they're brothers. And I brought her these big old Tomcats, right? And I'm the one that took them out of jail. <laughs> I would come home from work at night. And I'd go to cuddle with her, and one of them would jump up and <laughs> hit me with this paw and take off. Tell my like, brother, I'm the one that freed you. Doesn't it relate to the one who gave himself to us, and we do that to him? So it gets a little bit better. One night, this evil thing didn't like me laying by her. He would wedge his ugly self in between us. And I said, I am. Took off. Teach you a lesson. In the middle of the night, he's like this on my chest. I'm like, and he's breathing my hair. Get thee behind me, Satan. Something get thee behind me. This thing was evil. I'm glad she got rid of him. You remember those? He was so jealous. The other one was like one of those lottie dotty Christians, oh, whatever, feed me, I'm cold. But there's always one in the bunch. I don't know where I went. Where was I in the, in the Word of God? Right? I was talking about something. I went to cats and dogs and everything else. Oh, thank you, Lillian. Killian. Curiosity killed the cat. So, this is what I want to say. So, are you being troubled? Yes. And we blame everything on the devil, right? But the devil's not making you do it. Can I tell you something? Quit saying that the devil has made you sick and quit and start saying, in Jesus' name, I am healed. Yeah. I pulled my wife in the back to pray over my stomach because I was going, I was really bad. Before you all got here, I was really bad. I felt like I was like, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going to lose it. And I said, you know what, enemy, you're a liar. I told you to come back here and pray for me. I feel good now, right? Yeah. I'm doing my step aerobics. All right, I'm doing good. <laughs> I am doing my step aerobics. I'm, I'm giving the word of God. What do I have to complain about? Those who brought this other gospel to the Galatians brought trouble. They didn't advertise their message as trouble, but it was. So, 10 more minutes I have. I want you to understand something. The devil will put trouble. He won't give it to you. He'll put it in front of you and we take it. And he sits back and says, keep doing it. See, the thing about the devil is he doesn't advertise himself. Does he, does he come and say, oh, I'm the big bad devil, I'm going to make you lie, I'm going to make you do this, does he? No, he does it subtle. Yeah. He's been doing it before you were even here and I was here. He did it in the art garden. He did it to Eve. He was very crafty. He was very subtle. But I have an antidote for trouble. How many of you have a, a pest control guy? I do, you know why? Because I don't want the cucarachas coming to my home. <laughs> and if they're there, I want them to leave in Jesus' name. I, I don't like them. I grew up with them. I named them. They were my cousins and they were my uncles and my aunts, whatever they were, I named them. But now I keep them away. Well, guess what keeps trouble away? The gospel of Jesus Christ. So next time you begin to feel trouble, why don't you run straight to the word? You know why? Because when we don't run to the word, we run to that which we're comfortable. My comfortable position was alcohol. Because now when I had trouble, I would drink a few beers and it was gone. 
I was the talk of the bar. I was making everyone laugh, but I forgot. Little did I know I brought it twice for when it was over with. So there are some who trouble us. The antidote for that trouble is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I like what Paul says, some will trouble you. It means that someone brought this false gospel to the Galatian church. Churches, as he's bringing it to the churches today, right? False gospel just doesn't happen, people. People bring it. Did you catch that? False gospel just doesn't happen. People bring it. And the people who bring them are very sincere and charismatic. See, the devil is very resourceful. Heretics, you know what a heretic is, right? Anything that's contrary to who God is in his word. Heretics do not advertise their errors. Murderers, adulterers, thieves disguise themselves. So the devil masquerades all these devices and activities. He puts on white to make himself look like an angel of light. You know I know the difference between the true angel of light and the devil who claims to be the angel of light? I know the good news. I know the gospel. See, one thing I'm going to leave you with as I begin to close, because we have a special that we're going to have someone sing a beautiful song that we can actually align our, our hearts right with God. But I'm going to share you something that helped me. How many of you met a sin sniffer? A sin sniffer? Someone that goes around... Looking for other people's sin? Wait, wait. wait. <laughs> wow. I'm picking my book because I know you're not sure. They're sin sniffers. They look around for other people's sin, but little do they know they're probably smelling themselves. <laughs> so they're sin sniffers, right? God showed me the way not to become a sin sniffer is to know that grace and peace is the constitution of my Christianity. And when I stray away from having grace towards others and having peace in my own life, I become a legalistic sin sniffer. Yeah. You want to find sin in this place right now? Just touch the person next to you. You'll find all kinds of sin. I'm serious. But God showed me is the more that you begin to love people, is the more that you don't walk around sniffing for sin. You walk around looking for those who need to be delivered. Those who need Christ. Because God knew that you were going to be troubled. And I close in this. I'm kind of getting into my James and my Galatians because it's the same message, right? James talks about the tongue. I told you the story about the little boy who had a problem with gossip, did I not? Did I? I think you guys know, right? So we, well, I'll tell it again and then we'll close and then we'll get in the worship. This little boy was in elementary school. He was in an old country town where there was mountains all around. And he was known as the elementary gossiper. All he did was gossip and talk about other people. And there were so many fights within the church, within the school, excuse me, that the teacher didn't have enough. She was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And her husband said, why don't you pray and ask God to give you direction? She goes, this little boy's paying in division. She goes, ask for God to give you direction. So she sat there and prayed, and God says, turn on the news and find out the 10-day forecast. And on Wednesday, it said that the winds were 60 mile an hour winds. It was going to be windy all that day. So God said, I want you to go out and buy a pillow filled with goose feathers. You know what goose feathers are? And I want you to take the class to the top of the mountain as the wind's blowing. And that little boy that has a problem with gossip and division, give him the pill. Now how many little kids love to tear things up? And give him a knife. And have him stand on the top of the mountain and as the wind's blowing and being down on the town to cut the pill open. And he's, yeah, yeah. So he did, he cut it, and the feathers flew all over the countryside. And the teacher looked to the little boy and says, now I want you to go and pick every feather that came out of this pillowcase. I can't do that. The same way we can't take back what comes out of our mouth. 
We can't, but Jesus can. See, we all struggle with this. This is why I want to do the book of Galatians because we need to be a church this evening that we start to stand on the principles of God's word. And I love what Patricia told me, and I, I, don't, I don't forget this. It stays in my mind. Jesus is minutes away. See, I told her one day, yeah, Jesus is around the corner. You know, any day she goes, no, he's minutes away. And that has stuck with me. You know why that stuck with me? Because if he's minutes away, then should I be building up? Should I? Because if he's minutes away and he catches me tearing down, where am I going to be? So as Sister Lillian comes up, and she leads us in a worship song. I want to challenge you guys here this evening to open up your hearts. Are you being troubled? If you're being troubled, let the Holy Spirit of God bring the light to those dark, troubling places. Yeah. Simeon will give you the cue.